Hello and welcome back to the channel. We'll be doing another uh, simple history video, Deliberate Friendly Fire. I've watched this video personally about four times and and it's only been out for like a month or two, four months. So, yeah, I already know a lot about this video. Anyway, so, yeah, let's get on with the video. War. It's all about a deliberate, friendly fire. War is all about eliminating the enemy. Oh, dang it. Give me a minute. Right. War is all about eliminating the enemy before he gets a chance to eliminate you. Throughout history, during conflicts, rebellions, and wars, it's not... Often during Vietnam, during the Vietnam War, uh, deliberate friendly fire against officers was actually quite common, because um, a lot of people, because of the nature of the fighting and the amount of suicide missions which they were forced to go on, a lot of people tried to kill their officers. It's not been unusual for soldiers to be killed by their own side, either deliberately or by accident. Friendly fire or fratricide relates to accidental damage by allied troops to yes. one's own installations, aircraft, or personnel. Friendly accident, but often not accidents. Actually, most friendly fire is actually deliberate, and in throughout history, often punishable by uh, death and w without a trial that result in the deaths of fellow soldiers also often referred to as a blue on blue incident can happen quite easily even in modern warfare where highly sophisticated weapons and reconnaissance equipment are involved friendly fire has always been commonplace in warfare and will unfortunately continue to occur in the um, ongoing war in ukraine a lot of russian soldiers are killing their officers because of because they just can't deal with it or their officers are sending them to war and they're most likely going to die or they sympathize with the ukrainians which is also another common thing that's happening firing on friendly troops however doesn't always have to be accidental in some cases it is more accurate to describe certain cases as deliberate friendly fire Occasionally, in order to maintain discipline among their ranks or to punish deserters, officers would resort to the ultimate penalty, sentencing fellow soldiers. To this actually happened a lot during World War One, Two, and the Vietnam War, uh, mostly by the Americans in Vietnam and the French and British during World War One and World War Two, and Germany during World War Two. Death, and sometimes they would personally shoot the deserter on the spot. These actions have in the past been a recognized duty of a senior officer and been stipulated by martial law and the rules of war. These scenarios were justified as a necessary sacrifice in the name of retaining morale and discipline, although ironically this kind of behavior was also recognized as having a detrimental effect on soldiers. And often caused soldiers to run away more, actually, and meaning that in fact, um... There was a higher chance of you being killed by your own side if you tried to run away than the opposing. In some cases, however, it's been seen to go in the opposite direction. There exists a significant number of incidents involving soldiers killing their officers for a number of reasons, often for either pushing them too hard or making them take unnecessary risks. It was recognized that poor leadership has a massive effect upon fighting morale, and as a result can lead to incidents of mutiny and even assassination of an officer. If you've accidentally downloaded a malicious program that's infected all your devices, then you know how it feels to be impacted by technological friendly- Everyone... Everyone is being sponsored by NordVPN. And honestly, yeah, I love what they do, but it's so expensive. You know, Surfshark VPN, I find, is, does just the same thing, and is much cheaper. If you 
four extra months totally free. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, it's totally risk-free. Check out the link below to purchase now and access content from anywhere in the world without worrying about blocks. Such examples have happened since the earliest ages of military history. For example, a record from ancient history tells of a Pannonian mutiny in the year 14 AD. Roman legionaries killed their centurion named Lucilius because of the ah. harsh treatment they suffered under his command. And actually, um, there's some records that go back even further, but can't really be reliant. And so you can see that this is actually a prominent problem, which has been going on for millennia. And actually, because of that, we'll probably never actually stop. In particular, Lucilius had a bad habit of beating his vine staff against his men's backs. Once they had had enough of this maltreatment and combined with the harsh conditions of living on the outskirts of the empire, his legionaries assassinated him. During the war of the Spanish succession, ah. British regiments of foot were sent to Germany. On August 13, 1704, they were preparing for the Battle of Blenheim. A group of soldiers were paraded in front of their major for a speech. The officer, who was highly unpopular among his men, told them he wished that if he died in battle, he would have liked it to be by a musket ball fired from the enemy. At that moment, the soldiers were getting ready for the action and paid no attention to the words of the man they hated. The major treated them harshly and subjected them to rigorous training. After the battle was over and the British and their allies had won, the major gathered his men, raised his hat, and called for a cheer. The soldiers didn't share his enthusiasm, but instead expressed their opinion. And actually, um, there's a report that one of the sol the one of the soldiers who shot him at wanted to shoot him actually wanted to shoot him after the comment on which he wanted to die by the enemy's musket ball. Of him by sending a musket ball through his head. but instead express their opinion of him by sending a musket ball through his head. Actually, um, they were standing about, um, I think it was 10 feet away. Not 10 feet. Yeah, about 10 feet away. So it was really, so it was actually quite unlucky that he managed to die from that because muskets are incredibly unreliable. And more than a century later, during World War I, some British soldiers had the same problem with their NCO, who would treat them with total contempt. The dislike NCO became the victim of his men's seething hatred, because they had- Ah, this one, I think this was when they put a grenade down his uh, trousers, when that exploded, it injured, two, I think, two other men and killed the officer. Had no alternatives to rectifying the problem with him, the soldiers decided to assassinate him. They drew lots to choose who would carry out the task. The weapon of choice was a Mills grenade, which they forced into the NCO's trousers. Initially unaware of what was going on, the unfortunate victim could only see soldiers running away from him as fast as they could. Once he had realized what they had done, it was too late. The bomb exploded and killed him. The investigation couldn't determine who had committed the deed because all the evidence was lost. Yes. This killing of an NCO by his soldiers was the first recorded instance of fragging, killing a superior with a grenade as a sign of revolt. And actually, it happened a lot during Vietnam, this fragging, and it also happened a lot um, in a lot of other conflicts in uh, Asia. It was a phenomenon that became popular 50 years later during the Vietnam War. This story was not an isolated case, as the cruelty and horror of World War I was such to literally push men over the edge and alter their state of mind so that they performed illogical actions. However, discipline had to be maintained at all times, so the line could be held against the enemy, sometimes at an ultimate cost. There was no argument over this question to most officers, especially for the British officers from an yes. upper-class background. One of these was Brigadier General Frank Percy Crozier, who imposed discipline at the point of a gun. In the trenches, his men were told that there was no other way than forward. In his, I think he actually killed more than a hundred people for disobeying his commands, 
which I think is actually quite a stupid reason to kill someone. Look, the men I killed, Crozier said, quote, my duty was to hold the line at all costs. To England, the cost was very little. To me, even if the effort did mean murder, the line had to be held, end quote. Indeed, the general stood behind his words. In 1918, on the Stratziel Road, the general ordered his men to turn their rifles and machine guns on a group of Portuguese soldiers who were trying to flee the battlefield. And actually, um, they, the Portuguese hated that and actually threatened to pull out the war after this incident. That same day, he personally shot a fleeing British infantryman along with a German soldier who followed him. General Crozier was determined not to allow them to run away, since he knew how fast a panic reaction would spread among the other soldiers. By shooting the deserters, the general stamped it out immediately. The practice of maintaining discipline by shooting deserters is as old as the history of warfare itself. Yes. Unfortunately, warfares leave no time nor space to deal with it in any other way. Sometimes the outcome of a battle or even a war depends on the unit's resolve to hold the line. A good example of this was the Battle of Stalingrad in 1942. Even though the Germans had forced back the city's defenders onto a mile-long strip of land along the Volga River, they still managed to hold their positions thanks to their determination to keep on fighting. Those who lacked the enthusiasm to defend the motherland were backed up by the so-called barrier troops, specially trained soldiers for anti-withdrawal operations. These units were composed of army personnel, but were ultimately under the... And as well, you also had the fact that a lot of civilians joined in the fighting with what weapons they had at home, and then... Um, if they deserted, then there was always a chance that they were mistaken for a soldier and killed by the Soviets. Command of the notorious NKVD. The history of barrier troops in the Soviet Union dates back to 1918, when the state security organization Chika organized the anti-retreat detachments. Yes. The need for such units arose again in 1941. The Germans were marching through the Soviet Union, whose units were disintegrating en masse. To prevent the complete collapse of the Soviet forces, the Military Counterintelligence Department of the Soviet Army formed mobile barrier forces to catch deserters and prevent unauthorized withdrawal from the front line. And it was actually one of the most successful um, anti-desertion tactics. Mobile barrier forces to catch deserters and prevent unauthorized withdrawal from the front line. The following year, when the Germans launched an offensive toward the Caucasus, Stalin issued the notorious Directive No. 227, ordering, quote, Not a step back. Fulfilling the military order was a matter of honor. For all who waver, death on the spot, there is no place for cowards among us, end quote. On the battlefield, things were organized in a simple fashion. Barrier troops were positioned behind the advancing forces, looking for soldiers who tried to avoid fighting or leave the battlefield. When caught, these men were arrested and either sentenced to death or sent to serve in penal battalions. Or shot on the spot. Very often, barrier troops would execute the deserter on the spot. It's estimated that around 13,500 men were shot during the Battle of Stalingrad under accusations of desertion and cowardice. The paradox was that the Soviets did not need such units. Men of the Red Army fought vigorously to defend their country yeah. from the German invaders. There was no need for anyone to force them into battle, let alone keep them from running away. Therefore, starting from October 1942, the barrier troops were gradually withdrawn from service, and ultimately on October 29, 1944, the unit was officially disbanded. Maintaining a high level of combat spirit in the army is of great importance. The problem is that the circumstances that affect the soldiers' morale often go beyond the control of the commanders on the field. And often they just can't control them and eventually they will snap. In the last stages of the Vietnam War, between the Tet Offensive in 1968 and the start of the U.S. troops' withdrawal in 1973, the morale of the American soldiers steadily decreased. After several years of bitter combat, the results were barely visible, so soldiers began to question why they were fighting. When, in 1969, the American troops started with a gradual withdrawal, the men became less inclined to risk their lives in a war that was about to end. 
which led to their refusal to obey orders. The increased use of drugs among soldiers also contributed to the overall decline of morale. The level of insubordination among the American troops in Vietnam at this period went so far that the soldiers began to disobey their commanders. Soldiers usually rebelled against... They often... They sometimes didn't just disobey them. They flat out refused or left. The officers who were pursuing their own personal career by exposing the men to risky combat situations. These commanders were seen by soldiers as a direct threat to their lives and were therefore earmarked for assassination. Soldiers planning the removal of their officers were experienced enough to know that a murder committed with a firearm would quickly reveal the perpetrator. Yes. That was why they used fragmentation grenades which left no trace after the explosion and the term fragging was commonly used for these assassinations. One of these grenades was the weapon of choice for Private Gary A. Hendricks, who killed Sergeant Richard L. Tate by throwing it into his bunker through the air vent. The grenade that fell on Tate's stomach killed him instantly, while also injuring two other sergeants. The reason why Private Hendricks... They also knocked down the building which they were in. Hendricks ...decided to kill Tate was that the sergeant had caught him sleeping in a guard post and had given him a dressing down. However, if the soldier hadn't confessed to the murder, the investigators would have not known who did it. The grenade explosion leaves no evidence. When soldiers just wanted to keep their superiors under control, they would send them a warning by throwing a grenade into their trench or tent, but with the safety pin intact. This was supposed to make them think twice before making any risky decisions. But often they just carried on doing what they were doing before. Or do anything that might endanger the soldiers' lives. This led to a bizarre situation where officers often negotiated with their soldiers before going into combat operations. It is estimated that 1,017 fragging incidents occurred in Vietnam, yep. leading to 86 deaths and 714 injuries, mostly to officers and NCOs. Interestingly, most fragging attacks were committed by soldiers in support units far from the first lines of combat. The actual number of incidents was probably much higher. The authorities simply didn't want to decrease morale even more and also spare the victims' families from further pain by revealing the true cause of their death. The burden of war indeed can seriously affect a soldier's mental health. Such conditions... When um, Germans... When the Germans were in the Holocaust, actually a lot of soldiers were killed because they had ideas of freeing the um, people there. These two can cause deliberate friendly fire. Combat stress was the reason behind the 2009 murder of the U.S. Army's two medical staff officers and three soldiers at the Camp Liberty Combat Stress Clinic near Baghdad's airport. The murderer, Sergeant John Russell, had a post-traumatic stress disorder and suicidal intentions and aimed for an early discharge. After medical officers refused to help him with his plans, Russell loaded his M16A2 rifle and drove for 40 minutes from his base to the clinic. After he smoked a cigarette, he removed his identification tags and the gun's optical sight and entered the clinic through a back entrance. Yep. In a rush of rage and the desire for vengeance, he killed the medical staff officers who had refused to help him and also three other soldiers who just happened to be there. Sergeant Russell was arrested and sent back to the United States, where he was put on trial and sentenced to life imprisonment without the chance of parole. I think he's still in prison. Dying from friendly fire is probably the most tragic way for soldiers to lose their lives. Deliberate friendly fire, whether for maintaining discipline or as a sign of rebellion, is yet another example that war is a tragedy without limits. Anyway, that's the end of the video, so remember to like, subscribe and all that, and like, subscribe to uh, S Simple History, and that's the end of the video, and bye.